Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is an encore talk from something I gave at PERC uh, this past July. Um, and so, as I said, we do uh, a lot of user support in our group. And about a year and a half ago or so, we decided to do a pretty big overhaul of what it was that we were offering and took a look at everything and made a bunch of changes and started collecting some data. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about little bit about that now and I would be remiss without mentioning without mentioning all the other people that contributed heavily to this talk um, and some of them are in the user support group here and some of them not so um, actually I don't think I have I'm sorry yep so let me talk a little bit about our um, there we go. I thought I had a slide on that and I skipped ahead. So um, basically here at CU Boulder, we have a system called Summit. It's the other Summit. Um, and it's 450 compute nodes with roughly 11,000 total cores. And one of the interesting parts about this cluster that we run is that it's a joint system. So this was funded through an NSF MRI grant a few years ago. And it's a jointly funded project between us at CU Boulder um, Colorado State University, which is CSU, and then the Rocky Mountain Advanced Computing Consortium, or RMAC. So CU users have 67% of the share, and we have the system located here in Boulder. And um, CSU has about 23% of the share, and then we push the other 10% off, um, the other 10% of the cycles off to any institution that's affiliated with RMAC. And I'll talk a little bit about what RMAC is in a few minutes. Um, so just to give you kind of an overhaul, um, we have some GPU nodes as well and um, some Xeon Phi nodes. And in addition to, um, and, and some high memory nodes as well. So we have to maintain uh, user support for all of that. And in addition to our sort of primary system of Summit that we are probably most known for, we also operate a large scale data storage system called the Petal Library. And the Summit system is free for people that are affiliated with um, CU Boulder to use, but the PETA library has a nominal cost, and we think it's pretty fair um, for what we're charging. So Active Space, which is um, directly accessible, it's mounted on the Summit system, is $45 per terabyte per year. And if you just want Archive Space, um, it's $20 per terabyte per year, and that's just on tape. So some people use that for backup. We have other hybrids of the two and whatnot, but those are sort of our primary um, systems. And we also operate a condo cluster as well that people can buy into. So, um, you know, just to make sure that everybody knows what we're doing and how to do what the tasks that they need to do on the system, we offer a lot of user support. And this has really grown over the five and a half years that I've been here. I think when I started, we were doing a couple of trainings and we had a ticketing system, but um, we've really done a lot in the last few years. And this is, just a really real credit to the group that I work with. They are really on top of um, making sure that all these tasks are getting completed and that the users are really getting their needs met. So some of the things that we do, and I'm going to talk about most of these in this talk, um, we do a lot of trainings uh, and consultations, pretty typical of a research computing user support group. And of course, we have our ticketing system where people can submit questions and um, our team will answer them. Something that we've added in the last year and a half that I'll talk about is office hours, um, which have been pretty successful. And um, we do a fair bit of outreach. And I don't have a lot to talk about with that just for the sake of time. But um, one thing that we are doing is, or that we ha have done in the past, is really reaching out to some of the departments because I'm sure others of you that are in research competing groups know this, but sometimes people just don't know that you exist on campus. And um, I have to be honest, I, I'm a recovering scientist and I used to work at CU at, in, a, in another, in an academic department here. And I didn't even know research computing exists until I applied for a job here. So we're constantly battling that. And so we get out to faculty meetings and um, talk, but it's really the graduate students that are our primary users. So we try to do inroads with the graduate students through various methods like graduate fairs. And um, they all seem to have some sort of group that meets in each one of the departments. So we'll go to these groups and, and give a talk. Um, and then next year in 2020, 
we uh, sort of realized a couple of months ago that uh, my boss, Thomas Hauser, and some of the, the original staff had been here for 10 years. So we determined that 10 years is, is um, we're, we're going to be 10 years old next year. So we're doing what's called the year of RC. And that has a whole bunch of different um, uh, events that we have planned. And I'm happy to talk about that later if people have questions. But that's just some of the outreach that we're trying to do. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but for user support, um, our group configuration is the team lead. And then we have three full-time staff. One 20% 20 staff, 20 time staff member, and then um, we currently have a student. So we're not terribly large, but you know, we might be large compared to some other groups. In 2018, we had 730 active users on the system that we were trying to support. So as I mentioned, we went through a big overhaul in the last year and a half or so um, for general user support. So I wanted to talk about some of the highlights for that. And the first is training. So I spent a little bit of time talking about some of the outreach efforts we're doing, but honestly, the best outreach you can do, uh, I found at least on campus here, is trainings. And that doesn't necessarily mean just trainings that are high performance computing related. We have um, one of the most popular trainings that we offer is Introduction to Python. And it's not an HPC related Python training, it's just literally we assume that you know how to program in some language, so it's not a basic programming class, um, but we'll teach you how to program in Python. And it's an eight week series and it's wildly popular. We started out with one class that I think was four weeks and now we have two instructors teaching it every semester um, for eight weeks at a time. And we're filling the class so we, we um, uh, have an in-person and an online section and we're filling both of them for each class each semester and I think you know one of the things that I've learned over the years is if you put the word Python in a training people will come so what happens is we have this great training um, done by great instructors and oh by the way this is offered to you by research computing did you know that we exist here on campus and you have all of these computing resources available to you and so I think that that's really contributed um, to our awareness on campus. Um, and we also have some, um, a lot of other talks that we've expanded upon over the last few years. So one of them um, is containerization. And I think that containerization is sort of the new Python in terms of if you put that in a title, people will come to that. So we've been offering that workshop for the last couple of semesters um, periodically, and it seems to be fairly popular. And another big um, one that we teach is the fundamentals of HPC. And that is a six course series, although we've been fiddling with it a little bit recently. And that's, and that's intended to get you going on our systems. So we assume that you have no knowledge of how to work on an HPC system. And we'll start you with intro to Linux, move into bash scripting, um, then into uh, job submission, Slurm uh, is specifically what we um, are looking at and I'm just trying to sorry I'm looking at the chat questions here let me finish this and I'll get to them um, so we yeah Linux bash we do slurm then um, we talk a little bit about uh, profiling make and make files um, and uh, the last one is escaping me at this point but um, anyway the point is is that we sort of take you from the beginning and go to to the uh, what we feel like you need to know. So in addition to those, those trainings, we also offer what we call a new user seminar every month where it gives people, um, it gives people information about our system. So in other words, um, this is how you log in. These are the storage spaces that are available to you. These are the, um, this is the hardware that's available to you and things like that. And we have just a wide variety of trainings that we offer. And we've expanded upon this, particularly in the last couple of years, because we have a joint center um, with the library. It's called the Center for Research Data and Digital Scholarship. And now, all of a sudden, we have a whole new audience of people and a whole new set of instructors that are teaching things um, that now our users in research computing are aware of that they weren't before. Um, for example, about data publishing or, or um, other more maybe um, library centric topics that we don't necessarily have the skill set to cover. So um, let's see. So I have a few questions here. Do we share the materials? Yes. Yeah, so we have everything up on um, a GitHub instance and it's anybody can find it. 
Um, and it would be github.com slash I think research computing is, is where you can find things. Um, and if there's anything specifically that you're interested in, just let me know and you're welcome to use any of our material. Um, but we just ask for if you're using, you know, wide swaths of it, swaths of it that you give us some acknowledgement. Um, the Python class is a uh, non-credit class. Um, there is a push here right now on campus to do um, online course accreditation. And uh, we also teach an R series, and that's through the libraries. Um, uh, but um, and the R series is actually going up for being uh, an accredited thing for the university so that you can get this fancy certificate. This is I did this. Um, and I think Pyth the Python course is going to move there, but it isn't yet. And I'm going to answer just a couple because I have a feeling I might get caught here otherwise. <laughs> but let's see. We do encourage, contain so the question is, do you encourage containerization to allow your clients to install their own software? And we definitely do. We find that it, um, it, it makes it, things easier. Um, we teach both Docker and Singularity for containerization. Obviously, we don't use Docker on our um, HPC system due to the root issues. But um, we find that a lot of people are using Docker and then integrating with Singularity. So we do teach both. And I'm happy to put the link up in chat at the end. Um, Python sessions a week, it's one session per week. The session is an hour and a half long. Um, and we do have a schedule online um, on, the, it's definitely in the GitHub repo and it might be on our website, which would be colorado.edu slash RC, um, but I'd have to find it. And Tobin put the link up there, thank you very much. Okay, yep, sorry. So, um, yeah, so we've had in the last um, year over 400 attendees to all of our trainings that we've been offering across campus. Um, so that's pretty huge. That's a large group of people that we're um, getting to be regularly in touch with. We do offer a lot of our trainings online, but we found it a bit of a, to be a bit of a challenge um, because, you know, ju you just experienced why it's a challenge. So I'm giving a talk and I'm trying to look at the chat and manage that. And um, it's the same for our instructors. And um, so one thing that we talked about is bringing in a student to monitor the chat and you know, sort of answer a question in the room as if they're um, a participant. And that's great, except that to get coverage by students, you have to have a lot of students because they're you know, going back and forth in classes. So we could have a full-time staff member do that, and we have had that, but that's probably not the most efficient use of a full-time staff member's time. So we haven't quite worked all of that out yet. One thing that um, is available in our organization as a whole is that um, we can grab students from other groups in the information technology group. So I, I'm planning on exploring that. The way that we choose our training topics is um, both by request and by our user support staff members or anyone else who says, hey, you know, we've been getting a lot of questions about Linux. That's why we started the Linux one. We're getting a lot of really basic questions about things and it's clear that people don't know Linux or it's clear that people don't know Slurm. So um, let's do some talks on that. And the big thing that we've expanded in the last couple of years is what we're teaching and how we're teaching it in terms of online. Office hours is um, something else I wanted to talk about. So we've kind of been dabbling in office hours for the last few years since even before I was here. And it, for whatever reason, wasn't really working out. We would, um, so we're located in a very um, obscure corner of campus, which is super awesome for uh, us when we're trying to, you know, navigate between classes because there's no students down here really. But it's really terrible for um, doing things like office hours. So um, we go up to the main part of campus, or we were going up to the main part of campus to do that in the engineering building, which we figured most of our users were there. Might as well hit them where they are, but it was still very sporadic. But we started the center, CRDDS, and I mentioned earlier that's in collaboration with the libraries. And there, you know, the libraries is the center of campus. And so we have a room in there now, and we do um, joint office hours with um, research computing, the libraries. Um, the, there's a group here on campus called LISA, which is a laboratory of statistical, I don't know, they do statistical um, work. And so they're there to answer questions about statistic questions that people have. Um, we also 
joint with the research information office and they'll have faculty members come in to ask about grants and um, certain other things like that. So they'll come in and we also have a group here on campus called Earth Lab and they do a lot of GIS and geophysical uh, work and so they'll have a staff member there to answer questions about that. So we found with having all these disparate groups in the room at the same time, somebody will, not only are we getting more widespread about who's finding out about the office hours because all of these groups are emailing people that are, um, that they have access to, but somebody can come up there and they'll have about five different people that they can talk to about a various topic. So this has really grown, not only in terms of who's up there, but how many people are coming. So we initially had just one staff member up there um, per hour. Now we have two to three for research computing up there for two hours. And total, there's something like five people up there um, per week for office hours. Um, and it's intermittent for research computing. It kind of depends on the semester and what's going on. And if we're rolling something out that people have a lot of questions on. Um, but it's been fairly successful. We've been doing all right. Um, with it. And we've done 150 consultations since we began office hours and about 25% of those originated from office hour visits. So somebody would um, just show up at office hours or, um, you know, and we would sort of work with them after that. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the um, more process oriented things that we changed over time as well, instead of um, just the human interactions that we changed. One of the big ones was the accounts process. So this was something that's been going on for um, its legacy that was there for a long time and it didn't make a lot of sense and so we overhauled it. But the old process was really cumbersome and it was really difficult for people to get an account on a system, which in this day and age when you can, um, you know, I have something like five Gmail accounts and it's really easy to get one and ours was super cumbersome. So the way that it used to work was a user would request account on a web um, they'd have to answer a whole bunch of questions before they could even request it. Then a staff member on our side would manually reply to each one of those messages. Um, and then there was a whole nother email that was getting sent out about two-factor authentication. And um, then yet another email that was, um, that told people that, so the, sorry, the original email that would go out would say, hey, by the way, you also have to request a startup allocation. And, um, so then people would have to, the users would have to send in an email to request the startup allocation to even get going on the system. It was a long email that was getting sent out in the beginning. There were a whole bunch of steps in there and people were just getting lost. And so we would find out over time that um, people were just, uh, they weren't completing all of the tasks. So they would send us in a ticket and say, hey, I can't run. And it would turn out they never asked for a startup allocation. So um, in the website, questions were hard because people just didn't know what group they fit into necessarily um, before they were getting or what sort of resources they were looking for um, before they even had any real information about research computing. So we changed that totally um, and we made it a very automated system and we changed um, the website questions to what only to be what we really needed. So almost all of the whole thing is automated now. A user will go in, they'll um, submit a request to get a, um, an account and a startup allocation will be automatically created. An email will be sent with some information about their um, options in terms of like trainings or consultations and things like that. Uh, but the one thing that isn't automated that can't be automated yet is our um, two-factor authentication setup so that we do have to separately go in and take care of that. Um, and that's just policy here at the university. And, and I could spend hours talking about that, but you'll see very frustrated Shelly, so we won't do that. So um, this is a heat map just to show you what the impact of changing this accounts process has had on us here in user support. So um, right now we're just gonna look at the bottom two categories. So we're looking at um, tickets related to accounts and tickets related to duo, which is our two factor authentication. And we'll talk about the allocations in a second. And this is from January, 2017 through, um, sorry, my Zoom is covering part of that, April, 2019. And we made all of these changes uh, at the very end of the month of April, 2018. So most of the impacts um, were here in May of 2018. 
So um, if we like take a look at the account tickets over this time frame, <coughs> excuse me, originally we were sending out, there were about three emails per user that were um, going out in some sort of various form. Um, and more or less, uh, well, we just still don't have the three emails that are quite going out, but um, what we do see is if you take a look at this heat map over time, we don't see a ton of um, statistically significant changes in how many tickets we're receiving as a group um, that are related to accounts, except for right after we made the transition. But the difference is, is that all of the ticket emails now are automated. So before somebody was in our group was physically sending these out and now it's all um, happening automatically. Um, as I mentioned, Duo isn't happening automatically, but we did, interestingly enough, see a big change in how many tickets we were getting um, and sending out um, with Duo prior to this change in May and a little bit into June. Um, and I think that that's because there's just been a lot less back and forth after this transition period happened. Whereas before we would have to, there'd be a lot of questions from users about the whole setup and, you know, this didn't work, so try this and this didn't work. And even though um, it's not fully automated, it's still a lot simpler for us on the back end. We just have to go into the Duo instance and add somebody into our um, group. So there's a lot less emails that are going back and forth now because of this. And, oh, um, I, I don't know if the presentation will be shared. I assume it will be. <laughs> Oops, okay. So yes, perfect. Um, so the other big thing that we did that was even bigger than the accounts process um, was changing our allocations request process. So again, this was another legacy thing that's been around since the beginning of research computing that we took another look at finally and decided um, we needed to change it because we were getting a lot of um, questions about allocations. And you know, if any of you manage or you know, require people to send in allocations, you know that users generally aren't happy about having to send in allocations to begin with, but they're really not happy if it's really difficult for them to understand. So um, we do, uh, we have this uh, general QoS that means that basically anybody can run on our system and they don't have to submit an allocation request to do that. But it's only 20% uh, of the share and your priority is going, not gonna be super high um, if you opt to do that. So if you have a more, a larger, um, it, but that might be perfect for you if you don't have a lot of um, compute time that is needed. But if you do, it's, uh, we highly encourage people to write allocations. We do not mandate it, but we um, really encourage it. And one of the ways is through um, gaining an increase in priority. So um, previously, the allocation request process was about a 12 page document that um, if you weren't a computer scientist, you would have uh, not a great chance at understanding what it was that we were looking for. So there was a group of us um, uh, about two years ago now that took a look at this whole process and said, hey, you know, this doesn't make sense. We need to fix this. We're getting so many tickets from people. People are frustrated. And also on the back end, we're getting these account requests that we can't understand what's going on. So let's make it a little bit better. Um, so we, simplified and shortened the allocations request process at the same time in April of 2018 um, as all of the other things we're undergoing. And we're very specific now about what we're asking for. We give um, examples and we have a template online as well for people to follow. So we're asking um, sort of what software and compilers people are using, how many cores, how much memory, um, and uh, where they're storing their data. And, and we ask them to do some scaling studies as well. And we um, greatly encourage people to meet with us before they even start the allocations process because we find that it goes a lot smoother. And um, then that way we can open up a shared Google document and they'll um, populate that with some things and we can go back and forth with them. And, and even though it sounds like it's a lot of work in the end, it's saving us time. Um, and yesterday we actually met to talk about, you know, it's been about a year and a half now since we implemented this, how is this going? And um, we're, uh, talking about taking another look at it again, just to sort of see, because there still are things that we can update and change and make better. So we're gonna take a look at that as well. Okay. Um, so if we take a look at the, this heat, the same heat map that we looked at before, but now we're just looking at the allocations process above. 
<coughs> excuse me. Um, so uh, these are tickets that we're getting related to account requests. And again, we went through this change right about here. So it's in May. So we do see an increase, an uptick in tickets in those um, in that time span. But overall, after this transition period, and I'm not sure why it went through into July, um, except that this was a bit more involved, I think, for our users than particularly our current users, because our current users don't care necessarily about the account request process change because they don't experience that, but they do experience a change with the allocations requests. Um, but there were less tickets after that. In fact, um, uh, I guess I don't have the number here. I'm not quite sure how many less, but we had an overall decrease in tickets after July of 2018. But interestingly enough, we had a 31% increase in allocation requests. So all that says is that, um, you know, there's just less back and forth. And I talked to the head of our allocations committee about, you know, what's anecdotally, what's your experience with all of this? And he said um, that there's a lot more fruitful um, interactions going on with users now because, um, it's easier for him to understand what people are asking. It's easier for us on the committee to understand what, what they're asking. And if there's a, a hiccup somewhere, it's, a, it's easier to go back and forth with them and try and fix it. And people seem a little less grumpy about the process too. Um, and one of the other metrics too that um, we pointed out was that our time to approval because of all of this, because it's easier for us to follow what's going on because people are following a template is that our time to approval for allocation requests went from 31 to six days. So we're moving a little bit faster than we were before. Um, our allocations per user. Oh, yes, sorry. I wasn't quite sure what you meant by that. But yes, um, we, we assign them per user generally. We do, um, so if we support a ta uh, sorry, a class, we'll um, have an allocation for the class, but it's still assigned to you know, the TA or the faculty member, whoever it is that's making the request. Um, and then, um, so who's on our committee to read and approve allocations? That's a great question. So it's the entire user support group and then um, uh, the head of research competing. Uh, so there's about five of us or so that are on there. Um, and, you know, we've asked the, so our group is split, the user support and the tech team and um, we have asked if they wanted to be on, uh, but they, they'll occasionally show up. And no, we don't have any outside faculty members, but that's not a bad idea, actually. We haven't, we had an advisory board for research computing in general that had um, faculty members on it, but we, it was a little bit, we weren't always getting um, people to show up and things like that, so. But yeah, that's actually not, um, I'm open to having faculty members on it. Okay, let's move along here so we can make sure we finish on time. So one of the other big things that we did was documentation. Um, we had previously had, again, this was a lot of legacy. We had our documentation that was coded directly onto the website, um, which was Drupal. And I don't know about you all, but I don't know Drupal that well, and nobody else seems to know Drupal that well either, at least in our group. And so that was causing a lot of problems because somebody would make a change and then suddenly the font would be really large on the web page and nobody would necessarily catch it. Um, and everything was outdated because nobody owned it because everybody owned it. So that's a problem. When everybody owns something, nobody owns something. And um, so it was, it got out of hand and it would get out of date pretty quickly. So what we did is we said, okay, we're going to put everything up and read the docs. And in fact, at first we put everything up in GitHub. Um, but then um, we found read the docs and it interfaced nice with GitHub and um, it's, it looks really clean. I think if you take a look at the snippet I have here, um, I think it, it just, it flows really well for people. And we assigned one person um, in the user support group who is now in charge of all documentation. And anytime anything needs to be changed outside of a tiny typo, it has to go out um, so that to committee and the sounds cumbersome, but it, basically what that means is if somebody makes a change or sees a change that needs to be made to a document or makes a change, they can submit an issue. And the person that's in charge of the um, 
documentation will send a message out to Slack and just say, hey, can a couple of you read this? And as long as they get one other person that has sort of vetted it, then um, we'll move forward with the change. And uh, we also, um, this person does a monthly documentation review to make sure that things are up to date and that we're not getting out of hand. Oh, one other thing too is we've added a few videos um, for on-demand and we plan to add a lot more because we find that people seem to like a lot of on-demand things. Okay, so that's some of the things that we've overhauled and I wanna talk a little bit about our collaborations because they've meant a lot for us um, for user support and our users specifically. And so one of them I mentioned in the very beginning of the talk and it's our collaboration with Colorado State University or CSU. And so this started um, because we have this NSF MRI grant that funded the procurement of Summit. And um, Summit went online in January of 2017 for a select number of users that were testing it. And then it went um, out to everybody in May of 2017. And as I mentioned, CSU has 23% of the share, whereas um, CU University of Colorado has uh, 67. And um, so CSU didn't have, they had some user support um, up at their location, uh, but they didn't have a full uh, sort of setup that we had because we've, we'd been running a system prior to Summit. So we had everything kind of in place. We had the container, the physical, um, everything set up physically for the system and whatnot. So um, they did have some partial user support in 2017, but then in 2018, it became a more official collaboration as um, even though the grant was well in swing by then, we um, sort of put in a structure that made it a little bit more official. So at first we had one of our staff members here at CU in user support became um, an allocated staff member for CSU. So they were answering any tickets that were coming in from CSU and, and whatnot. And that wasn't really a heavy lift in the beginning because there weren't a lot of users. Um, but then we did a, what we called a summit on summit. So we had this big meeting that said, hey, by the way, you know, there's this, there's this large scale computing resource called summit that's available to you. And that added some more CSU members. But um, what really took off is when we hired a dedicated CSU staff member. And um, this person was half time and they sat here at CU rather than at CSU. And the intention for that um, was temporary so that they could get to know how a user support group works because they were gonna be kind of on their own up at CSU. And um, so this person would do office hours, um, answer tickets, do training and do consults. And they do them both in, online and in person. So they travel up there, it's about 45 minutes from here, uh, once a month or so. And our two institutions were in pretty regular contact to make sure that everything was flowing smoothly. And what was really interesting about this collaboration is it gave us a really great opportunity to examine the impact of user support on a research computing group. So um, from January 2007, basically all through 2017, CSU was able to access RMAX Summit, but they didn't have this permanent user support structure in place. And they only had about 36 users. But once we established that, um, that dedicated person, they grew rapidly and that number is from July, um, so it's increased since then, but in July they had 287 users that were on the system. But what's really interesting is you can see the impacts in their use of the share. So in 2017, prior to this dedicated user support person, um, CSU users were, CSU was only using 31% of their share. And after we brought someone in that was doing all of this training and whatnot, that jumped all the way up to 84%. Then we had some transition. Um, so this person left at the beginning of this year, I believe. So I think it was January 2019 when she left. Um, and so our the percent usage of the share dropped back down to 55%. Then they hired another person up there um, who was more remote. Um, and so they're, they've been working on um, doing more outreach. And that currently is up at 65%. So what this, I mean, there's a lot of moving parts here, but one of the things that is kind of interesting is that once we had a user support presence that was dedicated to supporting the users, suddenly, you know, the users were aware of this and they knew how to do it and they started um, using more of the system. So it was really interesting from a user support perspective. Um, and I'll talk real briefly about the Rocky Mountain Advanced Computing Consortium. Um, 
and this again was part of the NSF, well, their participation in Summit is part of the NSF MRI grant. RMAC has been around for quite some time. And what it is, is it's a group of institutions in the Rocky Mountain West that have an interest in high performance computing. And they may have an institution, or excuse me, infrastructure at their institution that they're um, supporting or they may not. And um, so there's, I forget how many institutions, I should probably know that, but I, I'm going to shoot in the dark and say maybe 20, but I might be kind of wrong about that. Um, and uh, there, you know, we range from larger schools to smaller schools and we're growing. We've been doing a lot of outreach lately to try and reach out to some of these smaller schools and let them know that, hey, you have access to a supercomputer. You know, you may be a community college in the um, far reaches of Utah, for example, but um, you have access to the system and we can help support you. So um, this RMAC in general, outside of the whole summit um, connection, has been really fruitful for collaboration um, and whatnot. And this, the reason that uh, we've been so fruitful with collaboration is I, why we were able to um, propose to NSF that uh, we could get the system, I think, in, in part. So uh, RMAC users, again, have 10% of the cycles on Summit. And um, there were about 70 users across six institutions. That was back in July. That's definitely grown. We've done, a, like, like I said, a lot of outreach in the last couple months. Um, and one of the really interesting things is that typically our Mac users weren't using that full 10% at all. We had a handful of people that were active and were using it, um, but we, we were really happy. We met yesterday and um, they're using uh, over 100% of their share, which means that they're um, coming in to send the other shares um, on the system, which is great because we've been at CU benefiting for a while from their lack of use on that share. And I, and again, this is this, you know, it's hard to say, but we've done this big push, not only at CU, but Utah has done a big push as well. And there's um, a lot of groups out there in RMAC that are now more aware of Summit than they were before. So finally, real quickly, I want to talk about um, some data analytics that we did um, to sort of more, um, to get some information about the benefits of these changes to our users. And this is not um, all encompassing, this is just a brief thing that I wanted to show um, based on some of the things I talked about. So we did is we input um, some data from our ticketing system, from our SLRM uh, job statistics, and some from training and consultations, and tried to figure out who is using their system and where are some of the pain points. And today I'm just going to talk about some of the data from the ticketing system and from the SLRM job statistics. And this, the period that this is over is from the, when Summit first came online, so January 2017, through the beginning of this year, January 1st, 2019. So our primary user base is, is physics. And we have a really big physics um, presence here at CU. We're, we have a lot of Nobel laureates. And um, there's a big in institute here. So it totally makes sense that physics is our biggest user. And followed by that is engineering. But we have a lot of non-traditional HPC users as well and groups like integrative physiology, political science, um, athletics, although athletics is mostly using our, our, they're less using Summit, they're more using our large scale data storage, um, but they need support sometimes as well. And um, we don't have information the way that our system is, we can't tell who the users are in terms of if they're graduate students or faculty, but Graduate students are by far the largest group that attend our workshops and send in um, and, and come to our consults um, and office hours. So I would uh, really guess that they're the ones that are using the system um, the most. So what are they doing on our system? Well, uh, most of them, almost 90% are running single node jobs and about 52% are running single node, single core jobs. So, um, you know, we've kind of known this for a while, but it became more apparent within the last year and a half or so. So we set up a new Slurm QoS that accounts for this. We used to have something called a debug QoS, which was meant for short-term jobs, you know, run it through, you're debugging your code. You can only run a job for an hour. You got to move kind of quickly, but um, that wasn't quite hitting the needs of our users. So we set up two new Slurm QoSs that um, were a little bit more tailored to their needs. So one of them is for um, testing, so they can run on um, for 30 minutes at a time, only on uh, one 
let's see, they can have up to 24 cores across two nodes um, for testing. And they can only have one job um, in this QoS at a time. And then we have one for interactive jobs. So if they're running a GUI or, um, you know, they're running a Python um, in the Python uh, viewer or something like that, and they need to be working interactively, then we have that set up as well. And that one, they could run for four hours. Um, and this seems to have been working pretty well for our users. We've been doing that for about a year now. And it, it has, you know, there's been a lot less complaints about people sitting in the queue because they can't get it in through um, any of the other QoSs. Over that two year time span, we ran 5 million jobs and 204 million CPU hours. Um, so what this says is that a large volume of our jobs are these single node jobs, which are generally speaking, smaller jobs. And so we need to have good support for them. And, and a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times these are beginner users who don't necessarily know how to take advantage of an HPC system. So we need to keep that in mind as well, that we're speaking to a lot of these beginner users that um, may not necessarily know all the nuances of the HPC system. So we need to make sure we have good support there. However, we also need to make sure we have good support on the other end because even though our larger jobs are only 10% of the total jobs being run on the system, they consume 95% of our compute resources. So if we don't make sure that those users are taken care of and that those users don't understand what's going on, then that can cause problems because just because somebody's running a large job doesn't necessarily mean that they're running it most efficiently. Um, so we need to definitely make sure that we're keeping on top of that as well. And then finally, um, we took a look at what we called overestimation. So overestimation was for users that were requesting wall time um, on the system. And we took a look at how long, how much time they were requesting versus how much time they were actually using. And if we just take a look at this, um, these far two columns over on the right, um, for 2017 and 2018. What we're looking at here is um, there's two numbers in each of those columns. And the first is for users who just used our default wall time. They didn't um, make any guesses about how much wall time they, they needed. And the second number is for users who explicitly requested some level of wall time. So in 2017, we actually changed our default wait time for our more pop, most popular QoS from 24 hours to four hours. And we saw a lot less um, overestimation for people that were using the default um, QoSs in 2018 <coughs> compared to 2017 when we had that larger default. But what's also interesting is that people that are um, explicitly requesting wall time are way overestimating compared to when they're just using the default. So that tells us that we need to do more, do more outreach and maybe even a training about how you figure out how much time it is that you need. So um, that's it. Uh, some other things we want to look at is why are some of our jobs failing? What's the average wait time in the queue and why? How can we reach out to some of these users to help them run more efficiently? Um, and we um, have held focus groups to solicit user feedback and we want to do some more of that. Um, we have a bunch of new projects coming up as well. So thank you. And I think I'm, I can take some questions. Oh, I see there are some questions. Um, do we preempt jobs? So um, rarely. We will preempt jobs. Um, so we allow, we have a preemptible QoS for our condo setup for, people, for condo node owners. Um, but on General Summit, we, you know, there, we get a lot of people that'll say, hey, I didn't ask for enough wall time. And it kind of depends on the situation. And, but we try not to do that because we feel like it sets a bit of a bad precedent. Um, how did we choose to do live online classes versus recorded videos? Uh, or why do we? Um, that's a great question. And we've been talking a lot about that um, because as many of us know, a lot of absorption of content these days is in short snippets and it needs to be on demand. So um, we're actually talking a lot about recording some of, well, we're trying to figure out what we want to do if it's that we just have someone sit down and do some short um, videos, particularly we were talking about our allocation process. Can we do something really um, short that is on demand so when somebody's writing an allocation request that they could watch that. But there are some people that just straight up want to watch 
the, the um, classes and they can't make it at that particular time. And we get tons of people every time we do a training that ask for those recorded sessions. Um, and we're, we're working on trying to be better and more diligent about recording all of our sessions. I'll just say it that way. Um, how do we track our drop and consults from? Um, so we keep track of who's coming to our office hours. So we were able to keep track of who's attending office hours and then how many um, tickets that we're getting and if their um, tickets are um, from the same users and if they're on the same um, topic. Uh, what are the challenges with online courses via Zoom? Um, so I talked about this a little bit earlier um, and I'm sure that there's more challenges than what I described, but for us it's been um, more, so it's really hard, you know, it's, you guys are watching me here, it was, it's hard for me to answer questions, um, to, to make sure that I'm monitoring the chat in a timely fashion while I'm talking. And um, it's hard for the, uh, the instructors have expressed some challenges around that. So what we try to do is have somebody sitting in the room to ask questions as a user, raising their hand and saying, hey, you know, I'm, here's a question from somebody online and then that way the instructor can answer it. And that works, um, but it's hard to dedicate a full-time staff member to that. Um, because they have a lot of other things that they need to do. And it's really hard to find enough student coverage in between. We'd have to have a lot of students and we just don't have that many students here. So um, we're looking into ways to kind of try and fix that. Um, but those are our primary challenges right now. Do we provide general desktop support to researchers as well or are your support services limited to research computing? Um, no, we don't do our, we don't do general desktop support at all. We just do HPC. Um, in my limited experience, MRI grants are good for funding hardware. They don't cover support. That's absolutely true. Our CU and partners committed to support for the life of the cluster. So yeah, when we, um, well, this, this was, bef I guess, so our system before Summit was called Janus. And that was, that procurement happened before I got here, but I'm pretty sure that was on an MRI grant as well. And at the time, um, they got uh, um, a commitment from the university to hire staff. So our infrastructure is funded through grants, but the staff is funded through a hard line to the university. And um, software licenses, we don't pay for software licenses, the general um, OIT. Well, is that true? I think we probably pay for some software, but the, the um, OIT as a whole, I believe, pays for most, most of the software. <clears throat> um, I'm not sure what a student employee couldn't do. Um, the lifetime of the cluster is about five years, so we've got about a year and a half left on this one. Um, so we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do next. And we do survey users. We don't survey them before, um, but we survey them after. And that is a, fun experience, let me tell you, because not everybody likes to fill out surveys. So um, what we found is that if we physically, and this is horribly not environmentally friendly, but if we um, print off paper copies and like literally put them in front of the person, they'll actually fill them out rather than, and we do have a link and we'll send it to people. Um, we'll give them the link and encourage them to do that. But um, people will fill out the paper copy and not necessarily the one online. Um, so yeah, we try to get a sense of if they enjoy the workshop, if they have other um, workshops they want to see. And we have, we whittled down our survey to about three or four questions. It's really short. It takes less than a minute to fill out because people also don't like to fill out long surveys. Are there any other questions? Shelly, I, I actually want to just make a, a comment uh, and then a question too. Um, when you're talking about the long videos, I know that um, Clemson was doing a, a long series of training videos for um, for their users, and they then they started uh, when they plugged them into like um, YouTube or some of the other platforms. They found that people were actually watching them only for about five to ten minutes, and then would drop off. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I think uh, they, I, I don't know if they continue doing those or well, but I, th I like we've been considering this, the short snippet ones as well. Um, I did want to ask you though about um, I know you talked about the demographics of the people using Summit and some of the resources. Had you actually done any demographics and disciplines on your training classes? Because I was wondering if they were overlapping or very different. Yeah, so um, we 
part of the survey, we asked them to fill out. Um, and so we sort of figured out we really only need to know two things. And we're trying to figure out the minimum that we need to know in the hopes that people will be more likely to fill it out. And one is what department they're located with, if they are located with a department. And the other one is their, their um, status. So whether they're faculty or grad student or whatnot. So um, grad students are coming to our trainings, our consults. We do have some faculty members come, but it's primarily graduate students that attend, then postdocs, then um, faculty, then um, staff, and then the general, oh, and then undergrads and then the general community is sort of the way that that breaks down. And I don't have information about what users are running on our system. Um, we could go back and look through their identity, the way that they, um, so look at their user ID and try to back that out, but that, that's a bit, I don't even know if we can do that. That's a bit problematic and we've run into a bunch of problems that way. Yeah, I was just more, more interested to see if you were uh, with the training classes, you were reaching a, a, a wide range of disciplines or if it was the still sort of- the Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we are still, uh, you know, most of our users are still traditional science engineers, um, but with this, you know, we, we have been, I, I put out an email to every single chair of the department on in every department here on campus. And I visited the School of Music and all kinds of um, groups. And so we've had some of them that have become users, but we're still pretty science heavy. Um, and with this collaboration with the libraries, we're hoping to change that and we have in some respects, but it's still an uphill climb. Um, oh, so I was asking, so. I was asking a few student employees to help with training, for example, to help with chat. Yeah, so that's what I was talking about where we've tried to get students to do it, but we only, right now I have one student and um, he's only in six hours a week and our instructor schedules don't necessarily match with um, his time in the office. So we could hire a lot more, so I've been contemplating how to do this about just hiring a bunch of students and just telling them, hey, you might only work an hour or two a week, or maybe pulling in from other groups in our overall OIT organization and see if they have students that we could use. Um, but I haven't quite worked that out yet. Um, office hours online in Zoom, we, we were doing that when um, we did the CSU collaboration and that works. Um, and we do do some consults through Zoom and it works fine. Um, but there's something, I guess, about being in person with people that I don't know, it seems to resonate. Um, for live training, uh, so it depends, the seating capacity depends on the room we're in. Um, primarily, we're in this room up in the libraries that seats about 20 people. Um, and we do frequently end up with full sessions. But we do have some rooms down here on East Campus, one in particular that'll house about 40. And with the Python class, we, um, and some of the other ones as well, we've filled that. But I'd say typically we start out about 20. And then we start, you know, as, as things go on, as the semester goes on, we whittle down a bit. We might get 10 coming in um, per session, but it kind of depends. Um, active users. Um, so last year, and I don't have the numbers for 2019 right now, but um, we had 730 active users who were supporting. And I'd suspect that's probably roughly the same. The last time I looked was in July um, when I was giving this talk for Perk, and it was maybe about 750 or so. So it's probably about roughly the same. We have something like two or 3,000 just straight up users, but those are the ones that are, have run jobs within the last um, month or two, I believe, is what. Um, what single factor do we use to justify face to face versus online methods for consulting? I don't know that there's a single factor. I think that um, we, people, I don't know, our users on campus here um, don't necessarily request online um, connections. They request to meet with a person. And we've had the, you know, we've offered the other way and, and it seems like our users are more interested in meeting with us. And, it's not a big lift for us, especially with this collaboration. We want to maintain a presence up on main campus. Um, I haven't really thought about um, doing a separate online consultation because um, I haven't really found it 
terribly necessary at this point, but that doesn't mean that it's not something that we could or should explore. Um, and it, in terms of if they come to us or we go to them, it kind of just depends on schedules. Um, and the, whoever the person is that's scheduling it. Um, so we do both. I'm just curious, I, I know this is me asking all these things, but I'm just curious um, as a result, um, the reason why is because when you have um, like economies of scale, I'm just trying to think like people sure. get on it's other people chat and then you, if it's potentially yeah. like an online rather than a one-on-one, -on -one, um, who's, who's all benefiting? So I'm trying to figure out in my mind the necessity when you get together is because you're sitting and typing over a computer where they're connecting and they're showing you jobs or things that they couldn't do and sharing your screen or other types of things. I'm just trying to figure out what is the, the single motivating factor. Is it just the way your clients are um, and how they feel or um, and does this vary from university to university? I mean, this is for other people on the call as well. Yeah. yeah, I think for us, probably the single factor is just this way we've always done it. So gotcha. <laughs> you know, sometimes inertia is a big thing. <laughs> right. I, I suspect Claire is trying to end the call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. Anita, that's a great, that's actually a great topic. I think we should maybe think about um, adding that into the schedule to, to actually talk, delve into that one a little bit further on an actual call, like in yeah. a, kind of a focus. So maybe we could we could kind of table the answer to this. That's are, that's perfectly fine. Um, we're a couple just, minutes after now. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to make sure to thank Shelly um, very much for um, uh, absolutely. Time. <laughs> it's, it's, Thanks for having me. Thanks, Shelly, and um, for everybody, um, we um, have recorded this, so um, we'll put it up so you have that, and we also have the notes. If you haven't signed in, please make sure to sign in. Um, and again, thank you to Shelly Knuth um, from um, UC Boulder. Thanks, Shelly. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.